It's good to be back in Israel. I picked some peppers at Moshava in Yava in the 70s. Yes. And uh, very many things have happened in the world since then. Also in Israel, and mostly to the good. And you're right, if I could bring back some light from Israel to my own country, it would be a benefit for all of us. It's, um, it's nice to hear that the ideas are in. Research is where you find it, and we found our basis of research also in England. You're not tardy, you're not late, you're in the middle of the way, I think. Yes, let's see. Yeah, I'm a nurse, by the way. We are lovely, underpaid, and very important people. Uh, we work in teams, and cross-professional teams are necessary because the needs of the people are very different from each other. The basic assumption underlying what we do is in the picture behind me. Um, the crisis is come seven in ten cases, not from diseases in the brain, but from collapses in the life situation. That's the basic assumption. Why do we travel in mobile teams? We travel to see the trigger in the life situation. This is surprising. If you work in a hospital, uh, I did so for a few years. The last five years I have been responsible for running one acute home treatment team and one ACT team. Uh, the research is English and we do our best to have model fidelity. And I'll try to communicate about the, the implementation of research from England into the field and fjord of Norway. That's my story actually, a, a case story. Now, um, the ambulance worker called us from the home of Elizabeth. Elizabeth, he said, is suicidal and psychotic and doesn't want to go to hospital. So we said the usual thing, yes, we're coming, and in an hour, two of us was in her flat. And Elizabeth had tried to take her life by jumping down the stairs in the apartment building where she lived. It was difficult to communicate with Elizabeth. So the ambulance guys went and we sat down to talk and, and during the next two hours we, um, we got to understand what's been happening. Um, and what has been happening today for Elizabeth was that she's going to be a grandmother. Yes? Which is congratulations, at least as we think of it. But, but in Elizabeth's life, it's not congratulations. In Elizabeth's life, she's already kneeling under the pressure of taking care of her two grandchildren. And today she's heard a third is coming. The context is the mother of the grandchildren is 21 years old expecting her third child with her third man. Um, and Elizabeth is carrying the burden for all of them. Did you want to die, Elizabeth? We asked. No, I just ran. What could I do? I just ran. OK, that's a different story then. In the flat was also the mother-to-be complete with a doggy bag or a baggy dog thing from Hollywood, you know, these small... You have dogs? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't want to insult you, I'm from Norway. It's, um, but, but the picture to be seen in this home is in your face obvious. There is a woman in crisis, and the crisis is not that Elizabeth is psychotic, the crisis is she is invaded in her life 
by a borderless daughter with children. And the daughter had her own flat, but it was more comfy to live with mom. So the work of this crisis is not medication of psychosis, it's a social worker's task to sort things out of the crisis and to settle it. Yeah, the review says, if you do home treatment, three months after crisis, mental state is superior to standard care. It's nice to have this from the Cochrane reviews. It's what we see also. We have less readmissions to the services in home care than we do in hospital care. And I think that's pretty much the same around the world. Going, going to England, we went to England also in 2004, I think one year ahead. And uh, I had to ask, how, how, can you, how can you put nurses and social workers into doing assessments where we would use doctors and specialists? And they told me, the assessment that we do in the home is not the diagnostic assessment. It's the assessment of how dangerous is this crisis now? Can the patient be at home 24 hours more? Yes, no. Is it necessary to have a doctor? Nurses are good at such assessments. They are not complicated, they are not diagnostic, they are crisis assessments, and that's possible to do, even if you're um, not a doctor or, or a psychologist. We did find a richness of literature in England, and still that's where 19 out of 20 articles come from. The cuts of the NHS have been drastic the last year. Englishmen did a mistake. They, um, they borrowed money in the Emirates and they had to pay back. Yeah. There is a fidelity scale for these teams and I recommend this link. It's specific and nice. Now, for Elizabeth, we needed some medication, but it was not um, antipsychotics. It was antihistamines for sleep. When we could clear out the life situation, it was to help with the stressors and the sleep. Then it was high frequency work for a while. The typical um, treatment program for my team is three weeks and 10 consultations in the home. 98% of all the consultations we do are in the patient's home. Yeah, big country, uh, strange people. Uh, I live at the corner here. I think David's going to visit me later. We live mostly on islands. And again, it's about 2,000 square kilometers, my area. You take these small capsules with the uh, oils, the marine oil, omega-3, do you? No? Yeah, some of you, yeah. Um, how nice for our economy. In this area, uh, my uptake area, we deliver 40% of the world production of omega-3 acids. So we live off the sea, uh, hardly any forest. This is what it used to be. I guess you can recognize it. The situation before alternatives in the society. And almost everyone referred for institutions had to go inside. And the specialist 
was doing tightrope work, discharging as quickly as he or she dared. Get them out again because many are getting in again and we have to clear house. That's me in the old days. It's too late to fly. I have to handle what, I was a manager in the hospital, yes. And I was looking for alternatives. And we did find teams are simplified organizations, clinical microsystems. If you have only one psychiatrist, surround him with a donut of services. Then you get the most production out of him. So that's what we did. Give him a cross-professional team, take away anything that doesn't have to be done by a doctor, and support the patients as a group. Processes, process view is common in Israel also. In the hospitals of Norway, they have a tendency to look at the beginning of processes from the door of the hospital, while the beginning of psychiatric disease begins somewhere else, actually. It's in the home, it's in the work, it's in the substance use. The big box that's new for us is the one in the middle, data capture and uh, assessment in the society. Since we're here with David, I think I'll underline this point of HONOS. Health of the nation's outcome scales, the world's most utilized measure for outcomes in psychiatric services. It's not the best, but it's the smallest that's big enough. Yeah, this is important. How much time is there? I have... Ah, brilliant. Is the specialist up front in Israel? When the doctor comes to the hospital, does he meet the youngest, greenest example of a medic we have? Or does he meet the top specialist? In Norway, it's the junior doctor that's in the front. Um, back in the old days, uh, Americans had something going on in a country called Vietnam. So they, they did plan an attack, and then the camera showed us how they planned the, the care system behind the attack. And um, the helicopters lifted off, and uh, the Red Cross guys lifted off 15 minutes later. And this being the Americans, they didn't raise the tents, they just pushed the button, so the hospital instantly appeared. And when the damaged boys came in, the senior surgeon was in front of the tent. He was doing triage. The junior surgeon was inside the tent doing surgery. And the senior, the, the senior surgeon was doing the triage. And this was a surprise to me, but because that's all he did. All the time, when the wounded came into the hospital, their most capable surgeon didn't do surgery. He did triage in front of the hospital. And that's where the specialists can do the most good for the money, I think. So one of the big changes is, if you have one specialist, don't put him in the surgery, put him in front of your door to decide what's gonna happen. Of course, he'll do mistakes. He's human, but he'll do the least mistakes. For me, that was an eye-opener to see this film, and I've tried to implement it since. What's this? The, the clinical question, what's this? And if we are to make the principle work, the specialist will have to travel. That's been a big... Um, bump in the road in Norway to have specialists leaving the office and travel, but when they do, it's gold for patients. Uh, I don't mean gold like money. I mean for patients in, in outcomes. Yeah, the Englishmen, they had an alternative. Before I, I visited the home treatment teams, I thought if you are psychotic, or suicidal, you have to be in a hospital. Coming away from England, I understood that this is a choice. 
The problem is, is it safe to be at home for another day or night? If not, you have to go somewhere. But your diagnostics is not deciding where you reside. It's the safety situation, the caretaking situation around you, deciding where you reside. So people can be pretty ill and still elect to be at home. And my team gives people the choice. You can be psychotic, but if you feel that it's safe for you to be at home, we'll, we'll talk about it. That's what we do in psychiatry, we talk about it, yeah. And um, we obey the patient, and we haven't been wrong yet. We've met 2,500 patients so far. All of them referred to go into hospital, because we act in front of the door of the hospital. And we haven't been wrong in trusting the patients so far. The big tool chest will be in the home. Well, not always. Uh, the doctor, family doctor, calls us and says, yeah, um, a woman here, she's clearly suicidal, and she has to go to hospital. And we answer, yes, we're coming. And in an hour, we are in, in um, the car just outside the house. Walking into the house, the lawn is dead. The flowers are dead. The house should be painted two, three, four years ago. The windows haven't been cleaned. And I'm thinking, preconceived, I'm thinking this is substance abuse nest. What are we doing here? This is so obviously drugs. So still, we knock on the door. And um, the lady opens. And inside, the flat is as nice as my flat. And since I'm a married man, my flat is not too bad. Um, and I, I sense there is an imbalance between the outside and the inside of this dwelling. On the floor, there are two children playing, and they see the strange man in the door, look at mom, and mom comforts them and gives eye contact back. And I see normality. And I'm wondering, what, what's this? So we sit down to talk about it, and she's really at her wit's end. She cannot see any purpose in living. Uh, it would be better for the two small children if she was dead. Uh, and it would be better for everyone else also. So really precarious. I couldn't, I couldn't really avoid asking, you have a very nice flat. Uh, but, but what about the garden? And then mom looks down and says very quietly, I'm not allowed to be in the garden. <laughs> OK, what's going on? What's this? There is a shadow in the room. Someone is saying you are not allowed to be in the garden. Yeah. Would she have told me if we met at the hospital? I don't know. But this knowledge made us say, OK, hmm. we find out that, um, that her partner in life is abusive. And uh, we don't leave her from our eyes, and she goes with us to the hospital. We stay in the home until the children are taken care of from the social services, and she had to stay in the hospital for weeks on end. The police were involved. Her life situation was sort of protected, and, and it was solved again. She wasn't suicidal, uh, really. She wasn't ill, but her life situation was killing her. Yeah? And this is so much easier to see when you go home to see people in their life situation. If not, it's below the radar, and it's easy to think what the lady tells you is what you have to work with. Nah, go home and you'll see what you have to work with. In my area, it's, um, the question is, how, how is it useful expenditure of psychiatrist time to, to put him in a car and drive him one and a half hours and two ferries? 
Oh, it's 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 very good economy, because taking someone into the hospital in an ambulance, staying overnight in the closed ward, it's um, it's about five times the cost of driving the psychiatrist to the home and back again. Yeah, but you drive many times. Yeah, we do, but we do not have recurring patients. We we finish the job because in the society you can see when the job is finished in a different way than in the hospital. Um, sorry about this one. We had three unsuccessful attempts. Model fidelity is actually important. The long-term question is, can we manage to stick to the receipt? If you, you know waffles, yes? Well, it's a kind of cake you make, very popular in Norway. Jam, uh, yeah, waffles. Now, if you follow the receipt, it's not difficult to make a waffle. If you don't, you'll have something that might look like a waffle, but it isn't. Take away the eggs, and it's a different story altogether. Take away the psychiatrist, and it's a different story altogether. Close at half past three, instead of working in the evenings when people need you, and it's a different story, and it's a different outcome. So to have the teams sticking to the receipt long term, that's been a challenge. I thought it was the Norwegian illness to reinvent everything, to be creative on the model. But Professor Rudnick told me it's the curse of psychiatry. It's not the Norwegian illness, or maybe it's both. This drifting away from good practice is, is a long-term challenge. I wish we could collaborate in tying it down to a set model. First, we said, OK, we should make teams. Let's just change the sign on the door. We do travel a bit already. Let's call it a traveling team. That didn't change much. Then we said, let's do, um, mm, let's integrate it. Yes, that's cheaper. We gave two extra man years into the closed ward and said, when there is an, um, a referral, you go in the car and then you go see the patient. And you know what happens when you put two extra people inside the ward in the hospital? At last, we can do all the things we never get to do. Ah, we have plenty to use them for. So we cleaned the cupboards, ah, oh, we painted the shelves, we fixed everything, and they traveled about once a month. And that didn't help much. So we went to England, found the research literature, made a, a workable model, and then the director said, sorry, sorry, guys, hold it, there is no money. And the fourth time it worked. Yeah, maybe you'll have to try again a few times. That's the receipt with the eggs for the good waffles. Yeah, the last one, gatekeeping. If you do not hold, if the team doesn't hold the key to the ward, it will not success. Who goes into the ward? The team must be able to meet them first and say, is it possible to give you the other service? And since my team holds the key, 50% of all people referred to go to hospital today choose the different service. They are referred by family doctors for immediate admission into closed ward hospital system, and 50% of them, given a choice, chooses something else. The team must hold the key to the beds. If not, the beds will fill up. Yeah, I don't know if you do this in, in Israel. It's a very popular model. Someone decides what's needed, and someone else produces it. Yes? No. It will not work. Uh, the intimate connection between assessment, what happens in the assessment, and what happens in the treatment must be protected. You cannot have some nurses going around decided you need this and so, and then other people producing the service, so to speak. The intimate connection is called a relation. 
And the most important predicting factor for outcomes is the quality of relation. If you build in an organized discontinuity in your system, then you just, yeah, this is obvious, is it not? Or is it a question, David? Yeah, don't do it this way, you'll fail. So keep the same person, the same team doing assessments and follow-up treatments. They know what they can do <laughs> at this time. They know whether the psychiatrist is on holiday in Durban with the secretary or whether he's on call and really can come. They know what they can offer and they're the only one knowing it. If we going home to Elizabeth are different from the people coming to serve up the treatment package, then the connection is broken and the confidence is broken. Access. Telephone. I don't know about Israel, but in Norway and Sweden, if you don't answer the telephone within three rings, then people start hanging up. So we answer the telephone within three rings. If it's a meeting, if it's a meal, if it's a trip to the toilet, someone carries the telephone always. Been this way for five years, no exceptions. That's access, that's a standard of access. Yeah, integration is important and difficult. You, do you dance here in Israel from time to time, yes? Yeah. You can only dance with the people who want to dance with you, yes? So I try to dance with different wards and someone say yes maybe and someone not at all. So this is an ongoing story. I keep making myself lovely and uh, yes and no. That's the way it is. It's a slowly developing issue but to integrate a team really into a, an old set hospital system yeah, it's challenging, but then again, so was meeting my wife, and yeah, that's important. So, why do we travel? We traveled for companionship. It is early days in this new development of services. There are enthusiasts in uh, West Norway not too many of those. So we travel for companionship and to have a fellowship in development of these new services in the early years. Beware of the Greek bearing gifts, huh? Now you have a Norwegian bearing gifts. There is an app, it's free. It's the most commonly used tools, and if you want it, download. It's HONOS, it's Montgomery Osberg Depression Rating Scale, and it's MINI, Suicidal Evaluation. We use it for checklists, for planning, and what comes into the patient journal is the diagram you see on your right. Now, when two of us go out to see a patient on Saturday, then it's easier to remember if we have one of those diagrams on Monday. To give a report, to reassess, and to look at what, what was it that we saw, really. The points is, um, yeah. That's the average. The red one is the honors of people on their way into the service. On average, 11.4. The green one is what's happened in between, and we are particularly proud of one issue I'll show you. That's the, the suicidal ideation, the self-harming issue, and the difference that this team makes is quite a nice one. It's extra important because the gender is pretty balanced in um, the treatment group in these teams. I didn't know until I saw England and Antwerpen, but it's about 51% females and 47 to 41, 49% males. 
The teams seem to be acceptable mode of treatment for young men. They are most at risk of suicide, and the team seems to be able to do something about suicidal ideation in the population we see. Yeah, the 15% are nice, huh? That's something we do not control. That's an outcome. Pretty unique for Norway. The rest of the country is slowly increasing or staying flat. In my area, it's decreased. And if you have too few people, then it's easier to spread them over a large population when they travel in teams. A few specialists in a ward can only handle the people in the ward. It's easier to spread the team thinly. You reach more people in need when you organize it as cross-professional teams. Who transports the mentally ill in Israel? Police, ambulances, taxis? You know? Ambulances transport them. Families transport them. Good. And then they go to emergency rooms. And then they go home again. What's the value proposition in this? Send out a team. They'll assess first and transport later or offer treatment. We use half the number of transports in my area compared with Norway in general. That's a side effect of the economics of teams. I particularly lo love this one. The patients seem to like this service. I mean, you can talk about percentages and number of responses and so on, but this difference is big. Information is a big issue. Too little information explains a large percentage of the readmittances. These teams seem to be good at giving information. Lovely, isn't it? Satisfactory. More than half strongly agree. Okay, what, what else do you need to know? This is, this is the patient voice. It's the anonymous answers. We use the same question as the hospital does, and we have a very, very different outcome. Again. 50%, given an alternative, 50% got something else than admission. <laughs> now, when we go to see Elizabeth, the idea is skilled people from the basis of knowledge the backbone, so to speak, to hospital, arrives in Elizabeth's life. And if we allow ourselves to be illuminated by Elizabeth's situation in life, then we give her something else than we should get in hospital, yes? And in this, this change of the content of the service, if she comes to the hospital, she has one type of service. If we are illuminated by her situation in life, it changes, and in this change, 
is the hope of a better service for patients. Be illuminated by the patient's life, 